Good evening and welcome to the closing session of the Battle of Ideas weekend, entitled, Is Utopian Thinking Dead? Attitudes to the Future. Uh, my name is David Bowden, I'm an Associate Fellow at the Institute of Ideas and one of the organisers of the festival. Um, the session title obviously nods towards the 500th anniversary of Thomas More's Utopia. The term utopia, which he coined, was a pun on two Greek terms, which variously meant good place or no place. And that question of whether uh, Moore was trying to produce a, a political manifesto for a utopia or mocking the concept of a, a, a utopia um, is a, a, quite a kind of crucial discussion around understanding that book. Um, for kind of the purposes of our discussion, it's been quite striking that in 2016, um, it often feels as if, at best, maybe we are heading for no place, nowhere has, no one has any idea where we're going. Um, and that there's been, I think everyone's sort of seen the kind of social media memes where it is kind of very much feels like from the death of uh, Bowie to Brexit that it feels like it's the end of the world for many people. But at the same time, when people try to assure us that actually, no, things are getting better, actually we're living in a much more peaceful society, that disease is um, generally being overcome, that living standards are uh, rising across the world, it's generally looking towards the benefits of new technology that can bestow on us a kind of sense of positivity for the future. But yet at the same time, many of those people, often when we have discussions of the battle of ideas, get derided as techno-utopians, the people who think that only progress can come from technological innovation rather than social progress. Um, and in the backdrop to this, there was a very live discussion in innovation circles, kind of really kick-started by the likes of Robert J. Gordon and Larry Summers, talking about how uh, the era of great innovation may be coming to an end, that this may be a period of secular stagnation, where a lot of the great innovations of the 20th century that have really driven forward you know, some of what our you know, understandings of the capability of technology may be coming to an end. So in that case, are we actually all screwed? Is that the real... The, uh, where, do, where is it going to take us if our only hope for the future is innovation and we're not doing anywhere near enough of it? Discussing this topic, to my far right, actually both uh, literally and figuratively and politically probably, um, Dr. Yaron Brook, who is Executive Director of the Ayn Rand Institute, who for many people might be classed as a utopian, a dystopian, or you know, many things in between. Um, perhaps he would reject both of those labels, and um, we'll see. He's also the co-author of a new book, Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. And we are partners with the Ayn Rand Institute on this session, so thank you for giving us your support okay. to Yaron's left, again, probably politically, as well as literally, Dr. Eliane Glazer, who's a senior lecturer at Bath Spa University, associate research fellow at Birkbeck, a BBC producer, and author of the book, Get Real, How to See Through the Hype, Spin, and Lies of Modern Life. To my immediate left, we have Dr. Norman Lewis, who is the Director of Innovation at PwC and a globally recognized expert on future trends and user behavior. He's also the co-author of Big Potatoes, the London Manifesto for Innovation. To my immediate right, we have Kirsty Stiles, who is a tech and skills lead at Tech North, working across seven cities on digital skills, having previously been a tech journalist for the New Statesman, the Next Web, and Tech City News, and also used to do the economics podcast for the still do, yes. uh, weekly uh, for the new economics foundation which kind of is an explainer of a lot of economic ideas and analysis and which is a very popular podcast and it is well worth checking out if you haven't done so <laughs> and to my far left we have Carl Scherer, who is an architect who has worked and taught in the UK Europe and the Middle East he is also the co-author of manifesto towards a new humanism in architecture so a lot of thinkers a lot of manifesto writers do we have any utopians do we want any utopians? I'm going to ask them to speak for three to five minutes. And Yaron, if you'd like to get things underway. Sure. I, I think we, we don't recognize enough some of the, what our moderator mentioned, is how, how great life is today. Uh, we do indeed live in the least violent era in human history, the era in human history where there's the least amount of poverty ever. We, have, we are richer than human beings have ever been by far. It's not even close. Uh, technology is, is improving our lives every day. We are healthier, we drink better water, we actually breathe cleaner air than probably ever in human history. So we have to have a good starting point, and the starting point is life is pretty good in spite of all the doom and gloom, in spite of all the stuff that people tell you about how horrible life is. It's pretty good right now. 
But we're worried about the future, and I think we should be worried about the future. We, we have low economic growth. Uh, it seems like we're stuck with regard to innovation. Innovation is not progressing. They are real problems. Uh, poverty, while seems, uh, while we have fewer poor people than ever before in terms of real poverty, uh, it seems to be stuck. There seems to be little mobility. There seems to be little advancement. And it seems like there are no solutions. Now, if the claim that there are solutions is utopian, then I am a utopian. I truly believe there are solutions. I truly believe the world can be a much, much, much better place than it is today, both in terms of wealth, both in terms of health, and, and in terms of poverty and violence and everything else. I, I think the fundamental way in which we solve these problems is to respect the rights of individuals, to recognize the individual as the moral and political unit that is, uh, uh, that is, that is uh, of significance. We need to uh, recognize individual liberty, individual freedom, and we need to create political systems uh, that recognize those rights. In other words, we need freedom. We need to be free uh, in every realm of our lives from, I was on a panel earlier about drug policy, so from drug policy to uh, economic policy, uh, the state needs to get off of our backs, needs to leave us free to pursue our own values, the values that we believe will lead us to make our lives as individuals the best that it can be. I think when we do that as individuals, all of us are better off, and society generally uh, is better off. And we live in, quote, uh, I, 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 we would live in a, quote, a, a utopian society. I, I fear that this um, rejection of utopia is a rejection of ideals. I am about ideals. I think ideals are important. I think we should strive towards something. We should, we, should, we should look for perfection. We should strive towards it. I think it is possible, but we're heading in exactly the opposite direction, unfortunately, today. Elian. I mean, what better place to be talking about utopianism than in the Barbican Center, <laughs> this haven of utopian living? Um, but to me, it's also a sort of retro artifact of a previous time in which futuristic utopian thinking was prevalent. And I think that utopian thinking is not dead, um, but it's in a pretty bad state. I think to say it's dead is, implies some sort of uh, normalize, takes on a normalizing quality. Oh, you know, you can't be utopian, you can't be uh, idealistic, you, you have to get real, and you have to get with a program. And I think there's a lot of that sort of austerity, straitjacket thinking around at the moment. Um, so um, I, I don't... I don't like the idea that uh, we, we get comfortable with the idea that utopian thinking is dead. But it's really suffering at the moment, and it's suffering for a number of different reasons. I look back to 1989 and Francis Fukuyama's famous um, article, The End of History, um, which has been much talked about since it was written. Um, Fukuyama argued that, um, that, he'd, that he'd, we'd got to a point where I, the ideological evolution of humanity had reached its end point, that actually the ideological struggles between left and right, east and west, had come to an end, and Western liberal democracy had been accepted as just the best ideological um, system there is. Um, but it's a very interesting article. If you, if you go back and read it, Fukuyama also says, the end of history will be a very sad time. Um, and it'll be a very boring time. And actually, you know, this era in which we give up on these grand projects, these grand narratives, these great um, struggles and uh, um, life projects and, and idealistic projects and so on, is a, is a, a sad moment. And, and I think that um, Fukuyama was a neocon, um, is a neocon, um, certainly was um, a neocon when he wrote this article. And I think there's a a buried ideological intent in his article that's quite interesting to think about. But I think his idea that, that we live in the end times, that we live in this, this era of, of post-ideology, we have to accept that this is, that does describe the world we live in now. You know, we've had um, triangulation of Clinton and then Tony Blair, the third way, the abandonment of left and right, of ideological polarity. You know, politician after politician has said, we don't do ideology, we just do what works. You know, from Tony Blair to David Cameron and all of them, even Obama, who, you know, I, I love. Um, he says, 
we, you know, let's have a let's call for a declaration of independence from ideology. So ideology has become toxic. Um, it's become thought of as a sort of a, a dogma um, that we must liberate ourselves from. So even, even while we think um, that technocracy is a bad thing, we're all technocrats now because we all talk about getting the job done. We can talk about populism and what's happening there, but I think when people now say, you know, the two-party system is over, no, actually we don't have enough po polarity in politics. And so, and I think the po populism is a response to that yearning for, for politics, for, for ideology. And, and I think that politics is the art of the possible, and we need to recover um, ideology, or at least reinvent ideology, so that we can get back to some kind of uh, utopian thinking, it, which is not maybe the creation of a better uh, fantastical world, but at least having that on the horizon to head towards. Thank you. Norman. When I was thinking about utopianism, I was reminded of uh, that great joke that Woody Allen tells in um, one of his movies, where the guy goes to the doctor and says, Doctor, you've got to help me. Um, you've really got to help me. My brother thinks he's a chicken. And the doctor says, Why don't you just tell him he's not a chicken? He says, Well, I would, but we need the eggs. <laughs> and it's like utopianism, uh, utopian thinking is like, We need the eggs. We need utopian thinking because. Somehow, we need to have some kind of optimism about the future, that we are somehow, in, g g given the fact that we're living in, in, in an unparalleled time, uh, you, nevertheless, there's a lot of gloom and pessimism about the future, and we need utopian thinking. My, my argument, and perhaps pretty controversially, is that if utopian thinking is in crisis or is suffering, as the previous said, then long may it die. Because I think you've got to make a distinction between utopian thinking and what we do as human beings, which is to solve problems, and we create progress. I don't think there's a direct relationship between utopian thinking and progress. Um, if anything, I think today the very opposite is what we need to be thinking about, which is this. A reason why I'm against utopianism is that I think utopian thinking today is a divergence. It's a diversion from the real political problems that we face. And the real political problem we've got is that we have lost faith in people. We have lost faith in human agency. We have lost faith in subjectivity, in the ability of people to create a better world, to advance society, to take the technologies that we have to transform them um, to, to make life even better than what it is today. And that's why I, I, I think utopianism is, is, is something that... Um, it's, it's like a retreat from the real world. And I think we have to engage with the real world. Dystopian thinking, on the other hand, so it's not like we're going to no place, we're going to a bad place. Dystopian thinking is, 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 is even more contradictory because whilst it talks about the real world, i.e. if you read a lot of the stuff about where this technology is going, um, for example, the whole artificial intelligence discussion, the whole point about machines becoming conscious and taking over, and somehow they're going to become, we're going to create these artifacts, they're going to come back and they're going to take us over, they're going to you know, make us redundant, it's going to be the end of, of, of humanity. Um, all these discussions about what this technology can do is really dystopian in the sense that it's painting a future which is, is where, where, where human beings uh, are shackled by the very things that they create. And, and, and the question you ask yourself is, well, how are we ever going to get there? And of course, that's the whole point. We're not going to get there because what we're doing is we're thinking outside of history. We're thinking outside of, we're thinking that somehow the things that we are creating are going to become the active elements and we are going to become the objects, that the, the active elements are going to take over and somehow we are going to lose our capacity to control what we ourselves have created, which I think is quite ridiculous. If you, if you I'll give you a really good contemporary example. This new book that's just been published by Yuval Noah Harari um, called Homo Deus. Uh, which is a really interesting book. Um, I think it's very fundamentally flawed, but he says, he, 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 the point he makes is that we cannot stop the march of history. We can only alter its direction. He sees a future where we have overcome famine, to the point that was made earlier, plague and war, where humanity now seeks immortality, boundless happiness, and divine powers of creation. 
what he means by that is that we can now live longer, that we can, you know, we can create uh, human beings that perhaps can live till 200 years, that we could have a, you know, a, 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 which he thinks is, 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 is very powerful. But ultimately, it will make us superfluous because of the, the things that the, the machines that we are going to create are going to displace us. Uh, as human. Now, now, I think you can't get anything more anti-human than a future that says basically posits the end of humanity. Um, and, and it seems to me that what we're conflating here is the human capacity to imagine, to think abstractly, to solve problems, and in the process of solving problems, to create technologies that allow us to gain greater and greater control over nature. That's what we've done. If you think about it, man, evolution of man, when we came out from the, from, from, when we came down from the, from, from, the, from the waters and the trees and we started walking around and we looked around us and we saw birds flying and we saw insects, we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could fly? We, they weren't utopian thinkers. They were thinking, well, I want to learn how to fly. The people that created the first flying machines weren't scientists, they were practical there were bicycle uh, uh, manufacturers, the Wright brothers. And I could give you a whole number of examples of how mankind has solved practical problems and then gone on to understand it philosophically and scientifically. And that capacity, that ability to be imaginative, is something that's inherently human. It's not about being utopian, it's about being human. Thank you. Thank you. Kirsty. I don't, as a tech journalist, get asked about utopias a lot, even though it's something that people talk about a lot in the tech industry, or at least they talk about things that they think are solving problems. But we've pretty objectively, I would say, reached a low point this week, uh, of many weeks in the UK, uh, and an alien, uh, if you can imagine the scene, who just arrived here, would probably judge this the worst year on record for utopians. It would be understandable if they did. We had two by-elections this week, which were almost covered zero by, by the media. Uh, one was for our ex-Prime Minister, who wildly misjudged the public mood uh, around our membership of the European Union. There was a second one for the seat of uh, an MP, Joe Cox, who was murdered while working in her constituency uh, up north. And if you add on the, but are they really children, uh, hysteria, uh, around tens, just tens of young people who are unaccompanied refugees, as, as, as far as we know, who legally have a right to asylum in the UK, and it could appear that we've hit rock bottom, depending on what your viewpoint is, of course. And as an ex-journalist, I'm you know, all too aware of the role that the media seems to be playing in all of the, stirring up all of this kind of uh, fear over hope. Um, but the tech industry, uh, in which I've worked for the past five years, is becoming increasingly vocal, along with people like uh, the vice chancellors of universities, about the messages that we're sending to the rest of the world and the impact that this could have on our future innovation and future jobs. So to address the question of whether technology is a threat to humanity, uh, utopia, or indeed uh, whether we've stopped innovating, both of these questions I, I've asked myself almost constantly uh, working as a journalist. And personally, I'd probably say yes to the first one. Yes, uh, technology could be uh, a threat to humanity. But I'd actually say no to the second one, um, whether we've stopped innovating. Um, but I'd suggest that innovating is not actually the goal that we're set necessarily setting out to do. Um, what we are innovating, there are lots of people working in technology today, uh, I meet an awful lot of them, but, but why are they innovating? And just to be clear, there are more jobs in the UK in technology than we've got people to do them in the North and in London. Um, so people are doing something, there is activity there, it's just what are they doing? Um, technology, in my case, I'm talking about digital technology, um, is, is just a tool. Um, the internet connectivity is helping us connect more things together, uh, helping us to do things more quickly, more efficiently, but that means that whole countries uh, power grids, defense systems are increasingly vulnerable to the likes of the DDoS attack, which fortunately just took out Twitter and Spotify over the weekend. Um, and there are questions, I would say, about um, that we need to address about whether technology equals less jobs, and it is, it is a point of debate. Um, it's what we do and what we don't do uh, with it, I think, uh, the reasons why the motives of the people involved that make the difference, and that's the difference between having a Wikipedia and Jimmy Wales and having uh, a Google. You know, both of those things utopian projects, you might say, exist in tandem and, and are actually um, informed by very different utopian ideas. Can we achieve a utopia and can tech help? To have an overarching single utopian view of the world, in my opinion, I don't think makes sense. It's, perhaps it's, that's just me. Um, you know, uh, if you look at Google and Wikipedia, um, whose vision 
uh, what goal? Uh, we have um, we have a stake. Many of us, we have many of us have a voice, um, but do we speak as one? Uh, I certainly wouldn't say so. Some people in the UK in the UK clearly feel uh, like mobile citizens of the world, but you know if you look at the vote around Brexit, some clearly do not. Um, if we can largely agree, very largely, that a utopia is a good life uh, for all people, and that's problematic in many ways, um, can technology help us achieve that? Um, I'd certainly say yes, but I'd refer back to my previous point. Technology is today largely dominated, uh, I, have, I have to say, by white men drawn from very few universities, uh, big companies, it would be Stanford, and often large corporations. Its workers are not uh, diverse in terms of their gender, their ethnicity, age to some extent, religion, class, disability, uh, geography even, um, which influences what gets built and what doesn't get built. Uh, I met a woman who was building a mail order uh, tampon delivery service and the all male venture capitalist stopped her halfway through and said, um, could you use a different word instead of period? <laughs> and that obviously was not the point. <laughs> um, Google Maps does not show up steps, and if you're a disabled person, that's a pain in the ass. And it also uh, gives you some idea of the kind of people that were sat around the table when they were building that product. Um, tech mimics the wider world, in my opinion, in a lot of ways. Uh, the world has become more unequal post-financial crisis. It reinforces those age-old patterns of power uh, and privilege. And so, um, you know, for me, uh, to think in a utopian, uh, small-scale way, I'd suggest that we have to democratise access to technology and to education. And these are all, you know, lofty things that I can just say because I'm sat up here. Uh, you know, make technology an attractive career, career for everybody. Change working cultures so that it's not women who have to go home uh, to look after children uh, or elderly relatives. Um, democratise access to finance, um, which can helpfully all perhaps be facilitated by technology. Um, you've got great organisations up north like F Disruptors uh, in Liverpool, North Coders in Manchester who are doing things like this at a very small scale. And those are my utopian asks. Uh, no doubt yours are all totally different and herein lies one of our big challenges. Thank you. Thank you. And Carl. Thanks, Nay. So I will be focusing on the cultural and intellectual issues that shape our understanding of utopian thinking today. That's what I wrote, but really it's a rant against techno-utopias. And I'm going to be arguing that the idea of innovation has been largely divorced from a broader sense of how we want to transform society in fundamental ways. The context for bold visionary ideas for how we can change society and the world that we live in has largely disappeared. And it's been, been defeated intellectually and in the cultural imagination that today sees any attempt at radical change as hubris. What we are left with is the notion of technological innovation, which is widely celebrated, but is removed from this wider intellectual and philosophical context. So technological innovation is an intellectual orphan. And I would argue that today we live in a technological utopia. And certainly to my younger self, the child that I was decades ago, looking at today, I would think that I would live in a technological utopia. So the idea that I could one day have this device in my pocket that would connect me to anyone in the world and put the entire extent of human knowledge at my fingertips would have definitely sounded utopian. But now that I live in this world, you would expect me to live in a state of constant ecstasy brought about by this technological progress and to celebrate it all the time. Instead, I spend much of my time moaning about social media and people's obsession with their gadgets. <laughs> Many developments help bring us to this point. Some are practical in nature and other philosophical and political. But it's not a coincidence that our most advanced technological gadgets tend to have an individualized form. So if you look by contrast at the technological products of motor modernity, like the aeroplane, the television set, the green revolution, and nuclear energy, they were all took a social form. And moreover, they were meant to be a means to broader social change. But our technological innovations today are largely designed for an individual rather than a social use. And to my mind, that says a lot about this moment. And it's not a coincidence that what we choose to do with these gadgets is to turn them onto ourselves and take selfies. Mm -hmm. It's this disconnection between the idea of social change and innovation that shapes our current attitude to utopianism. 
Our utopias revolve around ourselves. Our obsessions reveal the self-centered quest to become better versions of ourselves, but they say nothing of the kind of society we want to live in. The very notion that we could hope to radically transform society in itself is suspect today, having been defeated by what could be called the conservatism of small expectations. We are much more obsessed with things going wrong than thrilled by the prospect of change. Our cultural imagination, having been dulled by risk aversion and a philosophical suspicion of ideas to transform the human condition. What we are left with is a notion of technological pro progress that is detached from a visionary narrative. It's at once technologically savvy and socially impotent to a certain extent. And what I mean by this is that our technologies today do have a transformational potential, but it's less a product of a purposeful quest for social change than a byproduct of technological developments. So think of the difference between mobile phones and their rapid march to ubiquity and how we feel about something quite important which is genetically modified food by contrast. So some people would argue that in principle they have no problem with genetically modified food but they don't want to be at the mercy of multinational corporations. As if mobile phones are produced by artisans in a <laughs> Peruvian mountain. To me, the real point of utopias historically was to serve as a means for imagining different social and economic structures and a different world by consequence. The point was not so much to design this world, but to provide a vision, a template for the sort of transformation that would help bring this world about. In the absence of such visions, as is clearly the case today, utopias will at best be science fiction and at worst, one of those self-satisfied TED Talks. Thank you. Right, that's a, uh, what our panel thinks. I, can I see if anyone has any points or questions? Excellent. I think that pessimistic thinking which began kind of a countercultural marginal thing in the 30s. Then in the 60s, it, 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 it gained some momentum. And then I think it reached a point at the 90s when it became official policy. And I'm, I'm referring to the idea of sustainable development and all these ideas around environmentalism. We, because if you think about it, sustainable development means more of the same forever. So I think sustainable development is Fukuyamaism basically in steroids. So this was, this was quite, I think, a, a depressing moment. But the question is, do you think that today, with all this Silicon Valley Prometheanism, the idea that, you know, we could, Zuckerberg says, I will eliminate all illnesses or we could live forever. Do you think that this is a reversal of these pessimistic trends? Or is it because these people actually share some of the premises of this 60s pessimism, as Yarong has mentioned in one of his podcasts on Silicon Valley, is it that this is basically an accident and that it's just that these people are very bright and they think about solutions without having these solutions in what Carl said, uh, basically, in, in an idea of what a utopia should be? So is it, is it a utopia naked of any philosophical, uh, philosophical, how can I say, background? Thank you. Yeah, I just, I thought it was, uh, there was quite a nice contrast between the speaker who um, spoke about the end of ideologies and, uh, you know, how we don't have ideas on that kind of big scale perhaps anymore. And at the same time, this, this idea of the intelligent singularity or, you know, supposedly we are about to create uh, machines which uh, might uh, have intelligence which is equal to human beings and then the worry is that they will uh, run off and surpass us very quickly. I mean, I just, uh, just um, putting these two ideas together, uh, it, there's a kind of an interesting contrast here. But, so, I actually edited a, a, a very, quite a long time ago, one of the first um, journals on uh, machine consciousness. And, I, and I've, I've still not seen anything that really convinces me we're, we're very close yet. But there is an interesting thing here, I think, uh, which is we are starting to understand quite deep processes of how intelligence is uh, produced, even things like perhaps agency, and maybe even, though it might be quite, quite a way off, consciousness. So I, I think Norman's uh, dismissal of, uh, of, of the tech really sounded a bit too trite, because in a way, you, you'd want to know, uh, are there any really... Uh, 
you know, do you think there are deep principles we don't understand? Do you think there's some in principle reason why we couldn't have these sort of machines? And then perhaps one idea that it's very easy to dismiss as well is that, you know, with, with you know, uh, intelligent machines and uh, the possibility they might enhance our intelligence either individually or socially, perhaps there, is, uh, there are ideologies around this, extropians and uh, various people who are trying to create new ideas, maybe, but maybe they're just a bit too easy to dismiss. Maybe we should take them a bit more seriously. I think with our kind of encroaching, really existing high-tech dystopia that we have today, uh, one of the potential bright spots, I guess, would be the end of work through automation. And I think there's a lot of discussion uh, in this, on this sort of theme around that sort of idea. And for me, the potential for a utopia in the future really s uh, revolves around this question and who owns who owns the products of automation and whether that leads to an end of work or the permanent exclusion of a whole massive population uh, from those social products. In terms of utopian thinking, the World Attitudes Survey found that 80, over 80% 80 of the world's population is in favor of democracy, but less and less of us are taking part in democracy or in democratic institutions and less and less of our, us are voting. And it seems as though the, people really like the idea of democracy, but not how it seems to work in practice. Cynicism about pol politicians is enormous. Politicians are terrified of the media, and democracy doesn't seem to be working. Um, and I realize that political problems require political parties, and that political disengagement is not a technical problem. However, in the spirit of um, thinking utopianly, um, I'd like to suggest, um, and if we imagine, for example, Birmingham, the city of Birmingham recently had an electric, elected mayor foisted on it, despite the people of Birmingham not wanting one. And I was just thinking, imagine if the people of, people of Birmingham said, no, let's not do that. Let's decide to have citizens' government by ballot. Let's just go back to the old Athenian democracy thing and say, we're going to draw lots. You can all, all of people, citizens of Birmingham, can put yourself forward to, be, to have lots drawn and um, for two, a membership, a chamber of 200 people with an elected executive, let's take over the city council for 10 years, let's run all the services like education, housing, etc., etc. Now, I think that even just the demand for this, um, just be, for people to say, stuff all you councillors, stuff all the old-fashioned old election stuff that the, in the French Revolution was introduced instead of at, um, government by ballot because it was less democratic, the idea that you could actually have a chance of actually having, being able to be um, involved in direct democracy is about the only thing that would make me move back to Birmingham. And I think that even if in, it in, in, in itself would not resolve um, problems of distrust or concern about immigration, let alone in, inadequate funding for schools and hospitals, etc., but it could help to resolve the problem that you could have these really brilliant discussions with people about during the referendum about politics and they're really engaged, etc., and really into democracy. And then you'd say, well, come to a meeting and they say, oh, sorry, I've got yoga that night. I can't come. Yeah, when I read the uh, title for this session in the brochure, I immediately thought back to that mid-19th century pamphlet by Engels, uh, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. And listening to what Norman said, it, it reminded me of that again. Um, in as far as, I think the point of that pamphlet was that there were um, a number of utopian thinkers around, and he was trying to ground thinking in the conditions of, of society at the time. And, and, but I, I, I differ with Norman in as far as I think utopian thinking is needed today in a way it wasn't then. At that time, there was, there was a lot of utopian thinking, thinking a, lot of, uh, a lot of visions of how society could be, could be better. I'm not sure we've got that anymore. So I think the, the, the correction we need is we need more utopian thinking first, and then perhaps the arguments for how we ground that and how we, how we deliver it um, would be more um, important. When we're talking about utopian thinking, right, in, especially in the political sense between left and right, I think um, you know, that would be capitalism versus uh, socialism, right? You've got to look at the historical results. Socialism, a pile of corpses, 100 million people high societies, entire economies destroyed. Compare that with the right, all right? The founding fathers wanted to create a rights-respecting society, which is essentially a capitalist society, which resulted in the most prosperous, happy, successful country on earth, which is the United States. And I think just focusing on those contrasts politically would be ultimately important when it comes to utopianism. So, I mean, I, a lot of points have been brought up by both the panelists and, and the audience. Let me just... 
I believe that we have to separate the type of utopian thinking that we're talking about, and this goes to the last comment a little bit. Most utopian thinkers have assumed that they can create a society for us, that they can impose their will on us. Most books that deal with utopia are always books about social engineering in one way or another. Uh, I would like to uh, suggest an alternative uh, utopian idea, and that is to leave us free to decide how we want to live our lives. So if you don't value your individualistic technology, get a bunch of your buddies together under freedom, if you're allowed to do this, and go and start a commune somewhere and do it differently. That is, what we should be allowed to do is live our lives as we see fit as individuals, not have a, have a, have a social system imposed on us from above, which is unfortunately most utopias have resulted, is how it have been presented. Now, one other thing in terms of technological innovation, while it is true that we are problem solvers and we've always solved problems and we always find ways and, and we do things, they are social structures. They are uh, political structures in which, which encourage that activity and there are others that suppress it. There are others where the great innovators are burnt at the stake and there's some where they're allowed to make billions of dollars. They result in very different behavior. So I would suggest that we need the reason that we had the pace of innovation that we did in the 19th century and the reason that we still have the pace of innovation that we have today is that we had political freedom, uh, that we had utopian thinkers in John Locke and in the uh, Scottish and French Enlightenment who valued reason, who valued individual freedom, who valued uh, you know, individuals' ability to make their life better. And under those kind of those kind of frameworks in which individuals are allowed to pursue their ideas, we get great innovations. When we try to constrain, when we try to put people in boxes, when we try to tell them how to think, we destroy innovation. Now, we still solve problems, but we destroy the big innovations. It's not an accident that the last 200 years has seen, you know, out of all proportion, more innovation than the entire history of mankind combined. It's because the last 200 years have been relatively years of freedom. Elia? Yeah, I mean, I suppose what I'm arguing is that we've given up on political utopianism and sort of outsourced it um, onto an idea of technological uh, progress, um, as the, the, the iPhone upgrade as a, a, a replacement for political idealism. Um, but actually, even those technological innovations are not working. So, you know, innovation is slow. We just have gadgets with differently sized screens. Technology is not really solving the basic problems of human need, like providing toilets in um, the developing world. The post-work future, which technology was supposed to provide, you know, the socialists of the 1930s, Marcuse and so on, look forward to a life of leisure. Actually, technology has just created lots more bullshit jobs, in, in David Graeber's phrase. Um, and post-work future is, as somebody said, a, a dystopian prospect because we get our, our meaning and our fulfillment, our sociability from our work. Um, and, you know, just by any kind of common sense reckoning, for me, looking around a tube carriage and seeing everyone staring at their phone is a dystopian rather than a utopian image. Um, technology is not designed around ergonomics. It's not designed around what people actually need. We're not driving technological change. There are interests driving technological change. Technology is not being shaped around what people need. In terms of the, um, the point about uh, socialism and capitalism, I mean, it's understandable that people rejected ideologies because of the, um, the genocide of the 20th century and that people um, headed to, wanted to head towards a more stable uh, system. And Adam Curtis's documentary that's currently um, on um, the BBC iPlayer, Hypernormalization, tells the story of how um, self-regulating systems was really the, 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 um, the intention behind technological change to create stability rather than uh, utopian change. Um, but this stability has created this kind of sense of stasis, paralysis, dis dissatisfaction. And actually, the final point I'd like to make at this point is that you know, there are interests driving change. 
You know, we, we might outsource our intentionality onto markets and machines. You know, neoliberalism is the, the governing ideology of, of our age. And, um, and yet, you know, and it's really refreshing to hear you, you know, explicitly advocate for right-wing ideals. I would like more of that. But actually what neoliberalism does so often is to disavow intentionality onto markets, onto machines, say, oh, this is just this natural forces like Darwin, Darwinian evolution or gravity. You know, this is not what we're driving. This is just happening anyway. Um, and I think that disavowal is dis disingenuous and really dangerous. And what I want is, a more, uh, is, is to declare our in interests out loud, and then we can have a democratic debate about the kind of society we want. I think the, the, there is a connection between Fukuyama and, and the, the point that I was trying to make, because I think Fukuyama has been misunderstood quite a lot when he spoke about the end of history. Because I think the point that he was making was that he was making the point that this was the end of the Kantian belief in the human subject being able to transform anything beyond that. In other words, you now had techno technocracy. You know, society would be managed. There was be no longer this, 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 this uh, question of, of human agency uh, and, and human-based uh, uh, change or evolution into something different. And I think that's really the common thread here, because the problem I see with all of this is that the real issue that we're facing is, and I agree with the previous comment about you know, that we've, we've, we've lost a political vision, we have no sense of, of, of politics, and I think that's because we don't see it possible for us to transform anything, and that we've now got this kind of elevated belief in technology as being a solution to all the problems we've got. The real problem with that is that it's, we have so lowered our expectations and our ambitions about what this technology can do, that we're actually, I believe, hampering our ability to even advance the technology. You know, it's really interesting, when you think about the previous utopians and, and in the previous centuries, where they, where they were in an era of progress, where you, you, as part of the Enlightenment, where there was this vision, this, this, this greater expectation of, of, of a better life in the future, you know, where utopians, utopia was about liberation from oppression, it was about freedom, it was about uh, the liberation from work. What are the visions that we have today? You know, now it's about unlocking your iPhone with your finger. Um, it's about you know the freedom that you have to create your own profile on Facebook. Um, you know th that that that's where we've got to. That this is what we think is freedom. That this is what. what so, so in other words, we've really scaled back on even on what we think utopias should be. It's very interesting if you read Ru Russell Jacobi's book on the end of utopia. He makes a really great point where he says, whereas Thomas More dreamed of a ut utopia without war, money, violence, and inequality. Five centuries later, when you look at people like Heidi Toffler, Alvin Toffler, creating a new civilization, they actually see a world, the third wave of civilization, which has war, money, violence, and inequality at its heart. So even then our aspiration is no longer what it was in the past. So we have lowered our expectations, and the problem with low expectations is that we meet them. And I mean that in the, both the, the political sense, that we accept what we have in front of us and we don't see how it's possible to transform anything. But more um, pressing, in my opinion, is that the potential that we have, the technology that we have at our fingertips, is now being scaled back in a way that is very unambitious. You know, you look at artificial intelligence, and I'll just end on this, you look at something like the driverless car. You look at where, where all this is going. Just for a minute, just think. One of the reasons why they, people are interested in the driverless car is that it will reduce human fallibility. So we're looking for a world where algorithms, rather than free will, determines how we operate in society. Just think of that, about that for a minute. Now, whether it's possible for a computer ever to have consciousness or, 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 or free will, I, I would posit that it's not. But nevertheless, the fact that th this is one of the underlying assumptions behind what we are doing uh, indicates to me that we have a very dystopian, a very non-progressive, um, bleak view of human beings and therefore of the future. That we're, we want to 
get rid of human fallibility, uncertainty. One of the greatest things that we've ever had is the fact that the, the technologies have always had uncertain outcomes. We are no longer comfortable with uncertainty. I, I think Carl made the point. We are in a society that is risk averse, that we do not want to experiment anymore. We want certainty about outcomes about everything. And if that's the case, then we're shutting down the future, not opening it in any sense. Um, I mean, yeah, lots of things to say. I'd just like to make it clear that I'm not a tech solutionist or anything like that. I just started writing about it and it all got a bit out of hand. I guess I wanted to say, I mean, it's interesting because the internet is probably one of the most successful publicly funded innovations that ever existed. And it's what it, it's uh, all of digital innovation is built upon. And without you know, that support, that international support for, for building something like this, Tim Berners-Lee et al. wouldn't have got to where they did and, and we wouldn't have been able to build on top of it. I think one of the interesting things is, is, about, um, is about whether your, I, I don't like to name them because I might get in trouble, um, your large conglomerate tax dodging organizations are really playing fair. And, you know, we talk about it as though these companies have magically um, taken over the world, but really they've taken advantage of a tax system which was not built for, um, you know, international collaboration. And it means that they've had, a, I would say, an unfair advantage, which means that they, um, you know, could see that this was a problem. And rather than saying, oh, how can we help the world as a big you know, multinationals sort out the tax arrangements. They, they took massive advantage of it. And people say, you know, well, you can't blame them for that kind of stuff. But, you know, some people do blame them. Um, and <laughs> um, and I guess so interesting, one of the interesting things I've, I've read this year was about um, you know, consciousness uh, and about, um, uh, um, which the gentleman brought up about whether machine consciousness and intelligence and things like that. One of the interesting things that's happened in brain research is that um, over the time that we've understood brains, um, we've always used the kind of industrial type, t uh, type um, things that were around us. So, you know, when we thought that we were made out of sand and, and whatever in biblical times, that's how we understood our human bodies. And then it went on um, through the industrial revolution it became springs and and you know me me mechanical bits and bobs and things like that and today we talk about the brain the human brain as though it's you know storage and you know ram and da da da, da. and and that's actually stifled as far as uh, you know uh, as the reading that I've done um, stifled our um, where research goes into actually how the brain works uh, and when they talk about whether we could really download a human brain well you know people don't think that you could because it's not the same as a computer. Um, you know, it is, it is informed of everything that all of you have ever experienced and I have, and I'm experiencing this different to you, and you all go away with different versions of what happened. And um, that actually means that, that, that our understanding of humanity is, is actually not as well informed because of our <laughs> use of um, kind of shorthand things about how um, computers today work. That was just a kind of, a, 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 I guess, a slight point to what you were saying before, but yes, I mean, there were loads of different things that we could have talked about, well, I'll hand, hand over. Two separate points. The first one is, really, there's this impasse in terms of articulating the sense of projection of the possibility of ut utopia through an inherited political language from the past, which I think you, you can clearly see at the far end of the table. And um, there's this kind of an, 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 a way of kind of invalidating your position by trying to articulate it through whether be it, you know, the language of, call it neoliberalism or capitalism or whatever, or on the other hand, socialism, is there's a lot of references missing and it's kind of almost appears a bit of a historical caricature because it's not actually uh, updated to reflect the struggles of the world that we live in. It's kind of always reverting back to an idealized type that we no longer have a living connection to. So, so that is the problem in terms of saying, yeah, let's revive utopias, and then coming back to these categories that are pretty much depleted, and they're quite self-referential in, in, in their use, as, as we have kind of got the sense of this. So, so the left kind of bangs on about certain things, the right bangs on about certain things, but they all feel like there's a heavy sense of nostalgia to them, and there isn't really a bold uh, kind of attempt to get out of those uh, categories, not to become post-ideological, but to kind of re-embrace the original aspirations, be it about autonomy or about freedom, to kind of go back to the, to the original aspiration and think, what do they mean today? And I think this is quite lacking, and it restricts a lot of our ability uh, uh, to kind of talk about utopia in a real political sense. 
The second point is I want to highlight how disconnected this idea of technological innovation is from all our current cultural construct, particularly in the West. I mean, the biggest thing now uh, is self-driving cars, as Norm talked about. And there's this emphasis about who's going to break it first, who's going to create the most functional system, and who's going to kind of reap the rewards of this very transformational uh, uh, technology. And all the discussion happens through a purely technological medium. You know, we talk about the technical benefits of it, the technological benefits, and all of that. Meanwhile, we have an ongoing kind of a cultural and social and legislative environment is putting a lot of pressure on mobility. It's saying mobility is a bad thing. You have congestion charging, you have different ways of pricing. We are even designing city in a way to prevent people from moving around a lot. So there's this whole pressure to say that mobility isn't actually a good thing. The more we restrict mobility, the less of an impact we can have on the world. You can see like a total disconnect between the two, as if they belong to two entirely separate worlds. Furthermore, in my own work as an architect, we have the same kind of limitation. Any, any attempt on trying to kind of envision something bold and visionary on the, on the scale of the Barbican will be shut down because we're supposed to justify the architecture and the cities that we're doing now in terms of how low an impact they have on the world. In order to have any kind of visionary and utopian product like the one that we're in now, you need to have more of an impact on the world. This is what I'm kind of trying to say, that there is this fundamental paradox that we're not trying to come out of. We see comfort in the kind of uh, low expectation cultural world that we're in, and then it kind of becomes a sense of uh, fantasy or escapism to kind of dwell on those technological uh, uh, innovations. Okay, cool. So I'm going to take a, a few more questions. Picking up, I think, on something Norman said about uncertainty, uh, I think this is a, a really crucial aspect of the discussion. I'm all in favor of people having visions of the future, championing them, working to realize them and, and, and convince others. But what we also need is a lot of experimentation. We need a lot of attempts to, to see what works. And you know, if you look at where the truly big changes come from, right, these are the things that are least foreseeable, right, when they begin. And I mean, I think this is most obvious, maybe it's present many places in the kind of bureaucracy of science funding, where they demand that you're going to tell us what is the impact of these breakthroughs that you want to make. You, you kind of look historically at the kind of huge breakthroughs and the kind of impacts they have 20, 30, 50 years down the line. This is a kind of bizarre outlook. You can see it in kind of regulation of technologies, many other things that, that I'm sure people can provide more examples. And also in an outlook towards a kind of social experimentation, I think we need the same kind of spirit. You know, we have to have the confidence that the, the positive outcomes uh, are worth taking the risks. You know, and also the understanding that we don't have all the answers right now, but we have a very good idea about how to find some answers. You know, an experimentation is the key path that will, will help us find those things. I just want to see if I can ask a question that just moves the discussion on a bit. The point's been raised. Carl said the panel's been looking back a bit, perhaps a bit nostalgically, in, in terms of left and right or... Uh, socialism, capitalism, so on. I want to bring it up to date and say, well, in this country, uh, the impact of the referendum vote, whatever your view on that was, you have 17 and a half million people who basically wanted change. You know, there's, there's, there, there, whatever, whatever view you have, uh, the expressed intent was uh, things can't go on as they on, as they go on. Uh, demanding change, and, and there's got to be a positive, there's got to be a real positive kernel there. There's got to be something really positive uh, sentiment there that says, look, we can build something on this. We can, we can, we can look to positive futures. People, you know, the majority of the population voted for Brexit because the, they, they saw the barrier of, of EU and wanted something different. Now, my question to the panel then is, is the time right now for some form of social political utopianism that, that would uh, clarify, challenge, uh, define what some of those rather ill-defined, uh, nefarious, uh, although positive sentiments uh, for voting Brexit were? 
guess I'm a fairly simple person, really, and just listening to what's been said today and what's been said over the course of the two days. You know, we've had Brexit, people want change. Our politics is breaking down. Um, there's several things we don't know about. We've got genetic engineering, but we like it, but we don't like it. We've got biotech, you know. What I really want to say is, um, do we actually want utopia? Mm -hmm. We are really creative people. We can solve problems, we can create. What will we do with ourselves when we get it? Is that maybe what's behind it? I don't know. But um, we have the possibility to have it. We can have genetic modification. We can have biotechnology that can help us solve disease and illness. We've got uh, robotics and so on that can help us solve having to do the menial jobs and those kinds of things. We can solve poverty if we put our minds to it. We're very capable of doing it. Is it that the people with the power don't want us to have that, the people with the money? And, and so we kept in this. But the question is, why don't we just embrace it? Because there is the possibility to have it. On AI, I wanted to sort of uh, add one data point. I work for a venture capitalist startup in technology as a programmer, and uh, I find it hilarious that people are afraid that computers are going to become sentient and turn against us and take it. We're just not that good at programming. <laughs> <laughs> we're, yeah, we're very far away from making programs that are that robust. We can sacrifice loads of PhDs uh, on a program to just about beat someone in a game of chess or Go. Uh, and on the people are being afraid of automation, I don't feel robbed of all those hours I would have spent on the farm as a subsistence farmer without all that technology that sort of alleviated me from the responsibility of growing my own food. So I kind of think these arguments were made in the past. This technology is going to take us all the jobs away, but you know, if 95% if of the population is hunters, hunters and gatherers or working in the farm, then who's going to be you know, you're not going to be on this panel, basically. You're going to be, you're going to be fighting for survival. <laughs> so I thought you're on in his opening remarks kind of captured it for me, is that if, uh, if thinking that the future could be better is utopian, then uh, yes, you know, we want more utopianism. Uh, I agree with the, the gentleman here who was saying, uh, you know, that, that maybe, you know, we need big ideas, we need big thinking, we need a positive vision of the future. I mean, the problem with the, the utopianism is, obviously, that it, it tends to be passive. It tends to be, you know, just let's declare a future and somehow we'll get there. Um, it doesn't usually have any mechanism of bringing that about. And what we're seeing now is, is, as a couple of you discussed very well, technology is seen as the medium or the mechanism by which this utopia is going to be declared. And obviously that's not going to happen. And in fact, I'm, I'm with you, Carl. I work in, uh, in IT. I'm, I've been in the internet since the beginning. But I'm having doubts now. I'm having real doubts about you know, what exactly is so great about this technology. Um, and because I think the way you've posed it, Norman, is, is kind of like we've got this technology and we're not making enough of it. Uh, we're not kind of um, uh, doing enough with it. And there's some people out there who are saying technology is going to save us all. And we're being a bit more circumspect and saying, well, maybe it won't. I think there's another discussion, though, which is that actually, what is it turning us into? We, we get the technology we deserve, and what we've invented and what we've created is a, a kind of a fragmenting, isolating, I mean, the internet kind of, the idea that everything can be in small segments, linked to everything else with no coherence. I think that we, we've got to be thinking about how, how we do build a future and how we create people <laughs> that are able to build a future. And so I think some utopian thinking wouldn't go amiss here. Um, Getting back to um, Karl Marx and Engels and their angle on utopianism, I thought they basically just thought utopianism was a bit silly because it, was, um, you know, it wasn't based on practicalities. It wasn't based on a scientific based understanding of society. And if that's the case, then I think we're all utopians to a certain extent. And I'm certainly a, a utopian because I have dreams of a better future, but I've no idea how to get there. I haven't got a vehicle for getting me from A to B or to C or anything. I'm also quite lazy as well. 
So um, <laughs> I would rather, I'd rather not bother with democracy to a certain extent because democracy sounds like a lot of work. I'd like someone else to do all that stuff and I could just get on with living the life that I want to live. And, and not have to bother with it. So it's like with the Brexit thing, everyone was talking about, oh, we should have a say in about however the Brexit should uh, come about, whether it should be hard or soft or anything like that. Really, I don't really care about the details. Just get me out of the thing and you sort it out yourself, you know? And if it's shite, I'll, I'll shout at you. Right, that's about it, you know? So um, it's just the ideas of, is there sort of nothing better than democracy? Which is, in my sense, is a kind of lazy life of uh, just getting on with things. Um, that's all I say. Utopia, it could be argued, was a kind of romantic vision. Nothing wrong with that. Um, let me switch to another romantic situation. Um, sometime earlier this year, there was a social survey, not a scientific study, on whether, and the choice was, uh, whether people would rather give up their mobile phones or their partners. <laughs> Guess what they chose? <laughs> Norman, you, you made the point that mankind has gone after getting control of nature, essentially, uh, as, as, as way we've driven forward and looked for a utopia where nature was much more under man's control. And I think we've almost forgotten that's what we've been doing. And actually, some people don't even believe that's what we should be doing. And I think that's part of the crisis. I, th I think we need to renew that. What We need to have better control of nature. You may not like that, but it's the only way we're going to survive. That's how we've been able to survive. Man has learned to control and understand nature and we must continue to do that and I think for me that's a utopia and for better or worse mankind developed civilizations by learning to control water both floods and water supply for agriculture we have to learn to control the climate that's one of the ultimate things that mankind has to learn to control do I kind of dispute that man kind um, can control the climate? In fact, we can control the climate. I think we can control the climate by understanding the, the problems that we're creating for the climate and stop doing those things. Um, and so when you talked about the low impact, <laughs> debatable, but people in the global south are pretty annoyed right now about the impact that our lifestyle is having on their lifestyle and the difference that those lifestyles currently uh, you know, represent. Um, Carl mentioned something about a low impact world and would mean that we wouldn't be able to build buildings like this, but in the time when they built this magnificent, um, you know, briefly structure, they might not have known the things that we know now. Um, you know, I was on a panel earlier today about uh, big infrastructure projects, HS2, Hinkley Point, Heathrow. People are asking whether, whether it's Heathrow or whether it's Gatwick, but have kind of forgotten whether we've asked whether we really need extra airport capacity, given that Stansted has spare airport capacity right now. <laughs> oh, God, don't, don't bring it up. It's Gatwick or Heathrow. I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, I'd love to think what you said about Brexit. Um, you know, it would be good now if we could kind of make a positive step forwards, but the challenge for the technology industry, if we all think that we want phones and maybe we all don't, and I can completely agree with that as well, or we'll completely endorse that idea, um, is that a lot of the people that work in the technology industry, a lot of researchers that are here in the UK are the best people in their fields and they come from all over the world. Um, and um, it doesn't seem like as nice a place as it did uh, a few months ago. And you can say, well, that's uh, they shouldn't feel any worse, but you know, uh, attacks are increasing on on uh, ethnic minorities, etc. Um, so I can see why people might think that this is a less fun place for everyone to be. And I'll leave it there. Okay, Norman, anything you want to pick up on? I really disagree with uh, the people who are, who are demanding that we we need some kind of utopian thinking because, I mean, there is so much utopian thinking going on at the moment. I mean, think of Jeremy Corbyn. 
I mean, you think about the Labour Party, you think about, you know, and when we talk about, I'm, I'm talking about utopian thinking, which is not visionary, but is just completely unrealistic, unhinged, not connected to reality, uh, because that's what utopian thinking is. It's about a, an, another world, but there's no un understanding or indication of how you're ever going to get there. And in fact, if you go back and look at a lot of utopian thinking, one of the fundamental points about it, I think the point was made earlier, that it seeks to remove, to change mankind. It sees mankind as the problem, and it posits a world where mankind has become different. But it doesn't explain how or why mankind would ever get there, which can, in many instances, result in authoritarian you know, diktat as to what is going to be the, 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 the better life in the future. There is so much un, you know, unhinged, utopian uh, idealism at the moment. I mean, you know, we have a prime minister who didn't want Britain out of the EU, but is now responsible for negotiating a, a Brexit. And we actually think that that's going to happen. We, we, it, it, it seems unbelievable to me that we, we're in this fantasy world that we're talking about hard or soft Brexit, and we kind of got this notion that we can negotiate something, we're going to leave the, 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 the single market, and somehow this is going to be hard or soft, and we're just going to do this without there going to be any repercussions, whatever. It's just complete nonsense. But to your point at the front, I really do agree that what Brexit has done, it's really reinforcing my point. My point is about human agency. It's about what we saw in Britain for the first time in many, many years, ordinary people taking matters into their own hands, not listening to the experts, of asserting their right to determine what the outcome would be. And I think that is a very positive thing. That's not utopian. That's just the beginning. The question then is, how do we go from there towards uh, a, a transformative project? Um, that's not something I can talk about in, in the few comments that I've got now. But I, I, I think that's very positive, because it's exactly the, point, the opposite to what I think utopian thinking is about. It's here we have it right in front of us. We have human agency being expressed in that historically new way, uh, which is incredibly exciting. Because I'm just conscious of the fact that we're sort of running short on time. So what I'm going to do is ask you to, to respond to those questions and give us a bit of a final summing up, and then I'll come back to Norman and Kirsty so that you can also have a okay. sort of final closing line. But Eliane. Yeah, to sum up, I just think it's ironic that in this age of great freedom that we are governed by these deterministic ways of thinking that our politics is... Uh, inhibited by what's sometimes called the Overton window of uh, realist, what's realistic in politics, which comes to govern what we think is possible um, in terms of technology. I'm not so worried about sentient computers as I am worried by us reducing our human capacities to these computers which are stupid. I mean, you go to any supermarket and you see the, the robot checkout, um, which is malfunctioning about the something in the bagging area, and you have this human being next to it, is this sort of compensation for this stupid robot? So that's what I'm really worried about. You know, I think we really underestimate, you know, our, our intentionality, our agency as, yeah. as humans, and that goes for our, the way that we allocate resources. Are we okay with the fact that 1% of um, the world's richest earns 50% of the world's wealth? The idea that we don't have control over the allocation of resources um, strips us of our political agency. But I do think I want to end on this point about climate change and, and the fact that we are in a post-growth age, that we need to stop growing because of planetary constraints. And that puts a very different spin on the idea of um, progress and utopianism. It's not an expan it cannot be an expansionist project anymore. <laughs> It has to be a project that acknowledges the planet's limitations. And, um, and I think that we have to ask, you know, are we in a, a post-progress um, age? And I think Fukuyama's essay continues to, to resonate with that question. Um, and can we, but can we have um, a, a view of um, accommodation to planetary resources, which is fair and where the utopianism lies in its fairness? if not in its expansionism. Yara? 
That's a great setup. No, I think quite exactly the opposite of what we just heard. What, what we need is more growth. What we need is more control over nature. I agree completely with the last gentleman who talked about man's control over nature. That's how human beings survive. We survive by controlling our environment and not the, letting the environment dictate to us. What we need is massive more economic growth and massive more wealth creation. And we can attain that. We can attain that by going back to original aspirations. Yes, I'm all for going back to original aspirations and realizing that those original aspirations created during the, the Enlightenment were not fully realized. And it's time we went back to those original aspirations and in the 21st century realized fully those aspirations, which, me, re, which means fully realize the potential of individual human beings to live their life. Trust in human beings. I, I find it bizarre that we're so pessimistic and optimistic at the same time about technology. I mean, this connectivity, I mean, I've never felt more connected in my life. I moved 7,000 miles away from my parents. I can now Skype with them every week. Uh, when I travel around the world and my wife is, is, is at home, I can talk to her constantly at, a, at almost a zero cost uh, and stay in touch with my kids and, and with everybody. I mean, to me, we're more connected today because of technology than ever before. So I want to go back to original aspirations, figure out what they really meant, and then execute that. And I believe what they meant was individual freedom, and I believe that manifests itself in the political system of capitalism. I hate the terms left and right, particularly in an age of Donald Trump. I want to have no, I, I don't want to be anywhere on the spectrum close to him. So, uh, you know, I, I think left and right are not good manifestations of what's going on. I want individual, individual freedom. I want individual liberty. I want to go back to the, to the aspirations of the founding fathers who did not realize them consistently because they had slaves. But the idea of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that is a beautiful, call it utopian, I don't care, but it is a beautiful idea, and it's a beautiful ideal that we should continue to strive towards. And if we do that, then I think we can be optimistic about, about technology. And I think, you know, we are risk averse. I agree completely that we are way overly risk averse. But one of the reasons we deal with risk aversion is free people embrace risk. It's when we become dependent and we rely on others, and the government in this case, to give us stuff to provide us to protect us from, even from nature, supposedly, when we, re we rely on government to do all these things, that's when we stop taking on risks as individuals. Okay. Carl? Like Aaron, I too can talk to my family in Lebanon now every day on Skype. But that is the problem for me. <laughs> no, it's throw away the mic. <laughs> drop the mic, drop the mic, you did it. <laughs> but on a serious note, I think, it, as, as someone who comes from the left ideologically, I think it's quite sad uh, to kind of hear the leftist point of view articulate its limitations, its lack of belief in the possibility of change, and its kind of self-imposed idea of natural limits on growth, which is basically was the whole premise of leftist politics, you know, starting from Marx onwards, the idea that we can unlock more of the potential of the natural world and human potential through these massive transformations and overcome the limitations, the self-imposed limitations of capitalism. We've lost all of that. I think that is why it's so tragic then to hear the kind of the right articulate these ideas today in a slightly self-parodic way, but still articulate them versus the left that wants to come more entrenched. And I tell you what the practical implications, paradoxical implications of that that are kind of uh, uh, almost tragic to be is you hear people on the left here speak of, we would love more people to come in to Britain, we want to be an open, open society, we want more people to come, but we won't build more runways. So how are they going to come here? And <laughs> this is kind of Stansted. like, yeah, but <laughs> okay, I'm gonna tell the whole village to go to Stansted, not to Heathrow next time. <laughs> it's like, we're clearly running into every time I fly out of Heathrow, it takes me like half an hour, I have to queue extra. We're kind of holding up all of the traffic, airline traffic in uh, the rest of Europe because of a lack of inability to build a fucking runway. 
and then we want to make a virtue out of that. So I think, you know, it's this kind of sense of what I called in the beginning the conservatism of spoiled expectations. It's basically transformed the left into kind of a slightly nicer version of the conservatives. They're like, we're not doing it on ideological grounds, but in purely practical grounds. And unfortunately, that's kind of depleting our ability to come up with any serious answers to the issues that we're facing now. Thanks. Yeah, it's so, so problematic in lots of different ways, but it seems like we all disagree uh, in many ways. Um, but I don't know, you talked about the life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That's not for everybody. That's um, particularly for the, for the most wealthy 1%, particularly in the United States. The majority of people in the world have never set foot on an aeroplane. For, for me, that, that's, that's... They're not going to set their foot if we don't build more runways. That's the point. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the most, it's the worst thing that you can do for the, for, the, for, the, for the climate, one of the worst things that we all do. It's a luxury that many, many people do not have. Uh, and, you know, being from the Lebanon, there, is, there are so many more profound challenges rather than building a stupid runway in a, in a country that has so many of them already um, and good knowing what impact that has on the environment. I mean, maybe we disagree about that impact on the environment, but for me, I, I'm sold on that as a, as a really big challenge that we need to face now. Well, um, how about that we are all for unsustainable development? That's what I'm for, because I believe in innovation. I believe in human potential. I believe that, you know, why live in houses that are 300 years old when we've got technologies that can make your life so much better? Why not build new houses? Um, my final p point is, is really this. I, 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 I just want to mention one point about the, the, the point that was made about technology and about uh, individuation and all of that. You see, I don't think it's the internet or any of these technologies that have resulted in this. It's not, you know, if you look at children and technology, it's not because the technology exists, it's because childhood has changed. These are social things. Children have grown up in, in, in a, a risk culture, and as a consequence, they've found ref re recourse to use technology as a way of escaping from adult supervision. That's what's happened. And so they've internalized the technology. The technology is just the technology. The technology could be used for many different things. These are much broader social problems and, and political issues that we have to address. It's not at the level of technology that these can be solved. Technology is actually um, n n not, not the issue. My final point is this, that it seems to me that the more we institutionalize a culture of low expectations, uh, when we no longer believe in change, that we un elevate uncertainty into some kind of new religion beyond human intervention, it seems to me the more wishful our thinking has become. And that's why, you know, politically, I am opposed to the notion of utopian thinking. This is not a, mo a noble project. It's an evasion. It's a self-indulgent exercise, what I, in what I would call myopic misanthropy. It's like children playing cowboys and Indians, uh, which is not related to it. It's a fantasy which is divorced from history, and it doesn't advance our thinking whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you.